Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Thursday night Anamkara meditation program. And with all my heart and with all my love, I welcome you to our program tonight. Thank you for coming, and I see this, our Sangha members far and wide have been able to join us, uh, including Ben uh, all the way over in Australia and some folks from different parts of the United States. So thank you for being able to be with us this evening. So tonight is going to be uh, a Heart Sutra night. It's the last Thursday of the month. And so we'll be getting into that practice and some of the teachings of Buddha. Uh, and, you know, Buddha's approach in many ways from a kind of yogic perspective was the, a, a path of jnana yoga, the path of knowledge and wisdom, discrimination. Uh, and so the teachings, especially in the Heart Sutra, have this extraordinary quality of being able to uh, differentiate, to use discrimination, to separate ourselves from all the things that the mind gets involved with and, and uh, identified with moment by moment. So we can reclaim the fullness, the spaciousness, the infinitude of our being, consciousness itself. And of course, that's also why we start with the opening mantras. The opening mantras are an invocation of our highest nature and serve as a way to help ease the mind, quiet the mind, so we can be fully present. The mind spends so much time in the past, in the future, uh, and for it to come into this present moment where the real fullness of being is, that's where we come to know the truth of who we are and the truth of the nature of all beings and all creation here, now, in this present moment. So we'll start with the opening mantras. Shri Matakali Devi Ki Once again, with all my heart, with all my love, I welcome you to our program tonight and bring your sublime nature, your Buddha nature. You know, no matter what we talk about as the highest, to hold that awareness, thou art that, tatwamasi, you are that, that's your nature. 
So when we're talking about the nature of Buddha mind or Buddha consciousness, this boundless expanse of being that is also boundless compassion, boundless kindness, boundless wisdom, boundless joy, these are attributes of your sublime nature. And so the practices, whether we're doing the the heart sutras we'll be getting into this evening or other practices, the chants and the mantras, They're all an invitation for us to let go of being so identified with all the content of the mind so that we can come home to the truth of our being. And then, empowered by that, walk that into this world. Bring that boundless joy, that boundless wisdom, compassion. Bring that into the world, into everyday life. That's that's what the the practices, that's what the truth that arises from within empowers us to do. And so Buddha, that was, that was his mission. You know, after having done extraordinary uh, tapasya, ascetic practices, and seeing that that didn't get them to where he wanted to be, it just weakened his mind and weakened his body, uh, he kind of woke up to a, a middle path, not the extreme of asceticism, not getting caught in the world. And so when he sat under the Bodhi tree and vowed to enter that stillness until, till, he found the way through. So he could bring that back for the benefit of everyone. And so we continue to benefit from his extraordinary efforts 2,500 years ago. And so the Heart Sutra is one of the practices that he imparted. But before that, he was teaching, when he first came out of that extraordinary state of nirvana, of uh, Sahaja Samadhi, uh, under the Bodhi tree, one of the first things, the first teachings he gave was really uh, to set the, the truth in motion, uh, to set the wheel of Dharma, the wheel of the path, the way, Uh, in motion by talking about the Four Noble Truths. And it gives the context for then understanding what's this Heart Sutra about. Because the first thing, you know, he, he wanted to call everybody's attention to was, you know, the nature of this ordinary reality is it's, it's filled with suffering. Uh, And that's part of what humanity encounters moment by moment, day by day, and and has for all of our history. So we have to confront that reality right away. Wait a minute, life is full of suffering. And then, he said, but you can gain the clarity to see what's the root cause of that suffering. So then he said, so the, the cause of suffering is cravings, desires, attachments. And then, knowing that, okay, we can discern what the cause is for our suffering, then the third noble truth was to say, and there's a way beyond. There's a way to get free. We're not caught in that. It looks like that's gone on and on and on forever and ever, because for the most part, the mind stays caught in that web of identification. And so suffering continues, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. But Buddha, like so many great sages and and saints and mystics, found that, no, there's a way through that. And so that was the third noble truth. The fourth noble truth was then, and a way to get through that is the noble eightfold path. And so then the practices that Buddha taught that had to do with cultivating wisdom Uh, cultivating ethics, cultivating the state of mindfulness and meditation that empower us to get free of the mind, to be able to step away from those patterns over and over and over again that we've gotten caught in and see that suffering, yes, suffering goes with certain aspects of the mind. Suffering goes with uh, this ephemeral thing of the body, but the consciousness this boundless awareness that holds all of that in all times and all places, that is free of suffering. That 
is the aim of all the practices. And that's the aim of the, the Heart Sutra, is to become steeped in that understanding and to run the, that high, exalted truth of Buddha's vision yeah, through our mind, through the practice, so that we become steeped in that, so that it becomes accessible to us. Because it's part of the, the mystic way across traditions that each and every one of us has the capacity to know that fullness, to know the highest for ourselves. Uh, it can be inspiring to know that others have gotten there and experienced that, written about that. Um, we're inspired to write and share poetry about that and other kinds of text. But in the end, so what? If we're still caught in that suffering, inspiration's nice, but we want true freedom. We want to know that fully for ourselves. And at first it can, may start out intermittent, but we want it to flower into the fullness of that steady wisdom, that unshakable wisdom, that unshakable equanimity that also Buddha talked about as one of the four qualities of that state of true freedom. The practices are all about taking us there. And it's all of what Buddha talked about. Part of it had to do with really then focusing on the words the words that we run through our mind, right? Because the words shape our reality. And Buddha wrote it very beautifully in the collection that's known as the Dhammapada, one of the earliest collections of the sayings of the Buddha. And Buddha wrote, the thought manifests as the word. The word manifests as the deed. The deed hardens into habit and habit hardens into character. So watch the thought and its ways with care, and let it spring from love, born out of concern for all beings. As surely as the shadow follows the body, as we think, so we become. As we think, so we become. That's something we can see moment by moment. A thought through, runs through our mind, and it immediately stirs up a cloud of emotions, feelings. Uh, it might bring with it memories. It might have undertones from our unconscious of traumas in the past or ecstatic experiences in the past. Words are constantly playing through our consciousness and creating and shaping realities. In the Kashmir Shaivite tradition, they talk about that power of words. It's called matrika shakti. Matrika means the little mothers. Shakti, this universal power of consciousness to create. So words are the little powers of consciousness, seemingly so innocently present. They're in our mind all the time. Yet what they're doing, what are they doing to us? They may be binding us. They may be clouding our vision. They're shaping how we respond to others. So the practices are also about becoming very aware of what's running through our mind and how do we transform that. So we can see in many of the practices that we do here, for instance, with mantra and repeating mantra over and over again throughout the day. Well, if we're repeating mantra, then our mind is not creating these other realities. It's engaged in this pure power of consciousness, the shakti of mantra that can set us free. So mantra is a very powerful practice for reshaping the mind, and in reshaping the mind, reshaping reality for ourselves, our experience of reality. So Buddha's words uh, in the Dhammapada really help us to also cultivate that. So coming back to the Dhammapada and studying that, um, just reading it, uh, just allowing yourself to Contemplate it perhaps before you fall asleep at night or when you wake up in the morning to read a paragraph. There are several translations. Um, I particularly like the translation that Eknat Iswaran did of the Dhammapada uh, for its clarity and its depth. There's also a 
another translation that was done by Thomas Byron, and, and this one is more lyrical. And so it uh, has more the sound of like poetry to it. So I wanted to share some of the readings from the Dhammapada. And again, understanding that as we listen, you know, listening is a yogic meditative practice. It requires a certain amount of focus. It requires reeling the mind in that it doesn't wander over there and over here and up there and into the past and into the future. It stays present. It stays present so that it can receive the grace of Buddha's words, stretching now over 2,500 years. So this is Buddha talking about wakefulness. Buddha wrote, Wakefulness is the way to life. The fool sleeps as if he were already dead, but the master is awake. He lives forever. He watches. He is clear. How happy he is, for he sees that wakefulness is life. How happy he is, following the path of the awakened. With great perseverance, he meditates, seeking freedom and happiness. So awake, reflect, watch, work with care and attention. Live in the way, live in the Dharma, and the light will grow in you. By watching and working, the master makes for himself an island which the flood cannot overwhelm. The fool is careless, but the master guards his watching. It is his most precious nature. He never gives in to desire. He meditates. And in the strength of his resolve, he discovers true happiness. He overcomes desire. And from the tower of wisdom, he looks down with dispassion upon the sorrowing crowd. From the mountaintop, he looks down on those who live close to the ground. Mindful among the mindless, awake while others dream. Swift as the racehorse, he outstrips the field. By watching, Indra became king of the gods. How wonderful it is to watch, how foolish to sleep. The beggar who guards his mind and fears the waywardness of his thoughts burns through every bond with the fire of his vigilance. So the beggar who guards his mind and fears his own confusion cannot fall. He has found the way to peace. And then writing on the mind, Buddha says, as the Fletcher whittles and makes straight his arrows, so the master directs his straying thoughts. Like a fish out of water stranded on the shore, thoughts thrash and quiver, for how can they shake off desire? They tremble, they are unsteady, they wander at their will. It is good to control them, and to master them brings happiness. But how subtle they are, how elusive, the task to quiet them, and by ruling them, to find happiness. With single-mindedness, the master quells his thoughts. He ends their wandering. Seated in the cave of his heart, he finds freedom. How can a troubled mind understand the way? If a man is disturbed, he will never be filled with knowledge. An untroubled mind no longer seeking to consider what is right and what is wrong. A mind beyond judgment watches, watches, and understands. Know that the body is a fragile jar and make a castle of your mind. In every trial, let understanding fight for you to defend what you have won. For soon the body is discarded then what does it feel? A useless log of wood that lies on the ground? Then what does it know? Your worst enemy cannot harm you as much as your own thoughts unguarded. But once mastered, no one can help you as much, not even your father 
or your mother. So it's all about this discipline of the mind and cultivating that. The boundlessness of consciousness, the boundlessness of awareness, its freedom always exists. Always. All times. All places. It's unbreakable. But the mind and all its perturbations so captivates our attention that we keep entering its field and becoming identified with it. That's a habit. That's just a habit, a habit that we can break. So that even if the mind is moving, even if thoughts and feelings, memories and sensations are flowing through the currents of the mind, they don't disturb the boundless sky of awareness. That remains, that remains forever free. That spaciousness of awareness, that spaciousness of pure being, most easily experienced in stillness and in silence. So we cultivate that. We cultivate the discipline that it takes to help quiet and still the mind with gentleness, with love, with compassion, with kindness. If you want the the waves, the ripples on the pond of the mind to quiet and settle, you don't slap it. We're not violent with the mind. We quiet the mind. We treat it with compassion. And we withdraw attention from all those movements. And we shift our attention to the boundlessness of being, the spaciousness of that consciousness that is your very nature. So when we do a practice of the Heart Sutra, then we can see that's exactly what Buddha is inviting us to know through that practice. The Heart Sutra is exactly that. The Heart Sutra is the Bhagavati Mahaprajna Paramita Hridaya Sutra, the great goddess, Bhagavati, of this profound wisdom. It's the wisdom, the deep wisdom, of being able to step back from the mind and see all its movements not as who you are. All day long, we're identified with this thought, this feeling, this memory, and the things that we see, the things that we avoid. Even in the night, we have dreams. There's an ego mind in the dream identified with one thing or another. It's incessant. So it takes practice to be able to step back and rediscover the boundlessness of the awareness, the consciousness that is already fully present, holding all of that and unsullied, untouched, unbound by it. This is what the Heart Sutra invites us to know. This is what Buddha invites us to know, the truth of who we are and who each and every one of you is. That's who You are the boundlessness, the spaciousness, the freedom, the infinite compassion, the loving, kind, wise, steady being. That's what we want to know. That's what we want to know moment by moment. When we get clear, when we get clear of the mind, the mind desires the objects of the senses, the objects in its domain. But when we start to get the whiffs of the fragrance that comes from that boundless consciousness. Then the mind goes, oh, that was, that was extraordinary. Can we have more of that? Can we have more of that? More delight? More joy? More love? More compassion? More peace? More strength and steadiness? Not going to be possessed by the mind the way the mind tries to possess things. The mind is going to be informed by the truth of who you are. It's going to be infused by that. That's the light of that awareness that begins to then illumine the mind, illumine the body, illumine our thoughts, 
illumine our actions. That's what we're invited into. That direct knowing and the living of that into the world for the benefit of all. That's why Buddha was saying, and, and let the thoughts arise from concern for all beings. That boundless compassion is our nature. So different than the mind's little contracted perspective of wanting to possess this, worried that who has more, who has less, how can I have more, more possessions, more power, more this, more that. Hmm? It's all the mind. That's all the contracted, deluded mind. And Buddha knew that that mind the root cause of mind and its cravings, the root cause of the cause of that craving and attachment is root ignorance, avidya, the ignorance not knowing the truth of who we are, that we have a fullness to our nature. We have a, a boundlessness to our nature that doesn't make us and drive us to seek all these things outside like the hungry ghosts. We have a culture that has turned hungry ghosts into heroes, as if they would be emulated. People who hoard money, resources, at the cost of millions of people. Totally deluded. Totally deluded. We have to get rooted in the truth and walk that into the world, walk that into places of power, walk that in to transform this world. So that light of that truth sets all beings free, relieves suffering of all beings. So the practices empower us to do that. And so as we do the Heart Sutra, as we've done each month, you know, the Heart Sutra is a practice where we read through the text three times as a way of immersing the mind. Remember, by reading aloud and, and in that moment contemplating the, the power, the depth, the meaning of these words, it's helping to transform the mind. And the mind is constructed of words. So we start to change the construct. We start to change the nature of the mind. That's why practices like this have so much power to them. They go right at the root of what is the nature of mind. Well, it's a web of thoughts. Change the web, and we're not caught in it. So in the Heart Sutra, we read through it three times, out loud, together. And at the end, we repeat the mantra, Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasam Gate, Bodhi Swaha. Gone, gone, gone beyond, fully beyond. Hail the goer. Swaha, so mote it be. And when we repeat that, we'll be doing that with the drum. But remembering, this is a practice. Hmm? This isn't like the mind approaches, oh, I read a book, I hold a paper, I do. No, it's a practice. It's a yogic practice. So what does a yoga practice involve? Discipline, focus, attention. So this is a practice where it begins with asana, posture. How are we seated? Then it's as we're chanting it and saying it out loud. That's pranayama. That regulates the breathing. That also changes the mind and the brain. We know that from scientific research. Then as we get more absorbed in it, uh, we're removing our attention from all the other sensory input. Right? So pratyahara. You can find the eight limbs of yoga right in this practice. Pratyahara, withdrawal of attention, the mind, from the senses. Then dharana. Dharana is focusing. What are we focused on? The text. We're focused on the consciousness that gave birth to this text. We're focusing on the consciousness that's right here, right now, that is this text. You are Buddha mind right here, right now. Dharna, that focus. And dhyan, that's meditation. We get more and more absorbed, one-pointed, 
in that. And then meditation, dhyan, leads to samadhi, the complete absorption in that, to rest in that, to revel in that, the stillness, the spaciousness of pure being that holds it all. It's who you are. That's what you want to know. So there's a complete yoga involved in just doing this. So keep that in mind, even as you do it on your own at other times. We bring that kind of discipline, because discipline and attention is also a way of showing the love, the compassion, the reverence for the gift of grace that is the matrika shakti of these words. So, as you sit, as you prepare, bringing your attention to it, now we'll begin. Avilokiteshwara, Bodhisattva, coursing through Diprajna Paramita, clearly saw that all five skandhas are empty, transforming all suffering and distress. Shariputra, form is no other than emptiness, emptiness no other than form. Form is exactly emptiness, emptiness exactly form. Sensation, thought, impulse, consciousness are also like this. Shariputra, all things are marked by emptiness. Not born, not destroyed, not stained, not pure, without gain, without loss. Therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no sensation, thought, impulse, consciousness, no eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, no color, sound, smell, taste, touch, object of thought, no realm of sight to no realm of thought, no ignorance and also no ending of old ignorance to no old age and death and also no ending of old age and death, no suffering and also no source of suffering, no annihilation, no path, no wisdom, also no attainment. Having nothing to attain, bodhisattvas live prajna paramita with no hindrance in the mind, no hindrance, thus no fear. Far beyond delusive thinking, they attain complete nirvana. All buddhas, past, present and future, live prajna paramita and thus attain anuttara samyak sambuddhi. Therefore know that prajna paramita is the great mantra, the wisdom mantra, the unsurpassed mantra, the supreme mantra, which completely removes all suffering. This is truth, not deception. Therefore set forth the prajna paramita mantra. Set forth this mantra and say, gate gate paragate parasangate bodhiswaha. Avilokiteshwar, Bodhisattva, coursing through deep Prajna Paramita, clearly saw that all five skandhas are empty, transforming all suffering and distress. Shariputra, form is no other than emptiness, emptiness no other than form. Form is exactly emptiness, emptiness exactly form. Sensation, thought, impulse, consciousness are also like this. Shariputra, all things are marked by emptiness, not born, not destroyed, not stained, not pure, without gain, without loss. Therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no sensation, thought, impulse, consciousness, no eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, no color, sound, smell, taste, touch, object of thought, no realm of sight to no realm of thought, no ignorance and also no ending of ignorance to no old age and death and also no ending of old age and death. No suffering and also no source of suffering, no annihilation, no path, no wisdom, also no attainment. Having nothing to attain, bodhisattvas live prajna paramita with no hindrance in the mind, no hindrance, thus no fear. Far beyond delusive thinking, they attain complete nirvana. All Buddhas, past, present, and future, live prajna paramita and thus attain anuttara samyak sambodhi. Therefore, know that prajna paramita is the great mantra, the wisdom mantra, the unsurpassed mantra, the supreme mantra, which completely removes all suffering. This is truth, not deception. Therefore, set forth the prajna paramita mantra. Set forth this mantra and say, 
Gate, gate, paragate, parasam gate, bodhiswaha. Avilokiteshwar, bodhisattva, coursing through deep prajna paramita, clearly saw that all five skandhas are empty, transforming all suffering and distress. Shariputra, form is no other than emptiness, emptiness no other than form. Form is exactly emptiness, emptiness exactly form. Sensation, thought, impulse, consciousness are also like this. Shariputra, all things are marked by emptiness, not born, not destroyed, not stained, not pure, without gain, without loss. Therefore, in emptiness there is no form, no sensation, thought, impulse, consciousness. No eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. No color, sound, smell, taste, touch, object of thought. No realm of sight to no realm of thought. No ignorance and also no ending of ignorance to no old age and death and also no ending of old age and death. No suffering and also no source of suffering. No annihilation, no path. No wisdom, also no attainment. Having nothing to attain, Bodhisattvas live prajna paramita with no hindrance in the mind. No hindrance, thus no fear. Far beyond delusive thinking, they attain complete nirvana. All Buddhas, past, present, and future, live prajna paramita and thus attain anuttara samyak sambodhi. Therefore know that prajna paramita is the great mantra, the wisdom mantra, the unsurpassed mantra, the supreme mantra, which completely removes all suffering. This is truth, not deception. Therefore set forth the Prajna Paramita Mantra. Set forth this mantra and say, Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasam Gate, Bodhiswaha. Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasam Gate, Bodhiswaha. Gate, gate, para, gate, para san, gate, bori swaha. Gate, gate, para, gate, para san, gate, bori swaha. Gate, gate, para, gate, para san, gate, bori swaha. Gate, gate, para, gate, para san, gate, bori swaha. Gate, gate, para. Gate, para sangate, bo.
So we end with this prayer. And may all our practices truly benefit everyone. And may all beings know complete freedom from suffering. And namaste. Gone, gone, gone beyond, fully beyond. Hail the goer, you, you. Bodhiswaha, so mood it be. 
Gate, gate, para gate, para sam gate, bodhisvaha. And we run that awareness, encapsulated in mantra form, the shakti of mantra, and pervading all the way down to the marrow of our bones, so that we can rest in that, know that, never forget that, live in that truth, walk in that truth, breathe in that truth, sleep in that truth. That's our birthright. That's why you took form, to know that, to live that into the world. You're a bodhisattva. So thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for gracing us with your presence tonight. All you bodhisattvas, all you embodiments of the, the very highest. That's the truth. So thank you for coming, bringing your sublime nature tonight. Thank you for doing practices that empower you to bring this into the world, to live this with all the fullness of heart, and body, and mind that you can. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of all beings, we thank you. All you Buddhas, we leave the suffering of all beings. That's our calling. So keep the practices alive. Especially mantra, especially coming back over and over again. The mind, think of the, the dribble that runs through the mind. It's like having a polluted river running through your very being. We purify it with mantra. We let just mantra run through. And then when it's time for the mind to do something, to fulfill its dharma, to be an instrument in this world, well, then it can think appropriately act appropriately, bring kindness and wisdom and compassion into this world. And the rest, let it have refuge in the bliss of the infinite, the truth of who we are, the boundless, loving, kind, compassionate nature. So we know there's this infinite reservoir that we can draw on and bring into the world. That's what empowers us to deal with the, the mountains of garbage that are going on in the universe and the world now. We need that strength. We need that empowerment. So take refuge in the truth, in your Buddha nature, your highest self, and mantra as a throb of that. Let it empower you. Let it refresh you. Let it be like a beautiful breeze. and then walk that into the world. So with all my heart, with all my love, thank you for coming this evening. And thank you for the many ways that you support Anam Kara through your presence and coming, um, through sharing e-newsletters and YouTubes and, and for making donations that allow us to keep this going. So thank you, thank you. And most of all, thank you for being you and living the, the love, the compassion, the wisdom that you carry into this world. So namaste. So now we close for the evening. I hope you're able to join us next week. With all my heart, all my love, thank you for coming. <laughs>